great and mighty God, greatly to be praised. And we declare his greatness on tonight. As we lift up his name, as we declare in the earth that we hear greatness for each and every one of us. Hallelujah. Better days ahead. I'm living in the promise of God. A new day is here and I've got a fresh expectation. Better days ahead. I'm living in the promise of God. A new day is here and I've got a fresh expectation. Got a new perspective and it's loud and clear i'm not moved by what i see only what i hear i hear greater do you hear it tonight greater yes i hear greater 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 for my life i hear greater i declare it tonight greater yes lord i hear greater 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 for my life better days ahead i'm living in the promise of god a new day is here and i've got a fresh expectation better days ahead i'm living in the promise of god a new day is here and i've got a fresh expectation got a new woo, perspective and it's loud and clear i'm not moved by what i see only what i hear I hear greater, hallelujah, greater, come on, I hear greater, greater, greater for my life, I hear greater, woo, greater, I hear greater, greater, greater for my life, it's God's word is true. It's coming to pass. Yes, sir. It's coming to pass. God's word is true. It shall last. And if he spoke it, it's coming to pass. It's coming to pass. It's coming to pass. Got a new perspective. And it's loud and clear. I'm not moved by what I see, only what I hear. Hallelujah, take it up a little bit higher. Yeah, greater for your life. Hallelujah, woo! I hear greater, greater, greater for your life. I hear greater, can you receive it? Greater. Yes, 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 I hear greater, greater, greater for your life. I hear greater, woo, greater, speak it in your life. I hear greater, greater, greater for my life. I hear greater, yes I do, oh God, woo, greater, I speak it by faith. I hear greater. Greater, greater for my life. Woo! Greater! Join us Sunday mornings in the parking lot of Harvest Rain Church from 8.30 to 9.30 a.m. Bring your entire family and your pets too. And let's worship together in the parking lot of Harvest Rain Church and hear praise and worship plus an inspirational message from Pastor Doug. See you Sunday.
God bless you this evening. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let's uh, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we bless you and we honor you this evening. Father, we thank you once again for gracing us, Father, to be able to gather in your presence around your word. And Father, as always, we welcome the ministering gift of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we embrace your presence. We ask that you would minister to every heart listening this evening to the sound of my voice. And it is our prayer this evening that something will be spoken that will minister life unto the hearts of the people of God. And we pray that no one will be able to hear this sermon and not be changed in some way. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you this evening. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, tonight, I want to um, just want to just kind of talk to you tonight. Um, this has been strong in my heart uh, with all that's going on in the culture and uh, the isolation and uh, just ministering to different people and, and praying with different people and, and uh, trying to um, encourage people. Um, it, it's just been strong in my heart to just kind of just take a moment and just to remind uh, you, uh, uh, everyone, about the goodness of God and the love of God. Um, I was praying recently with um, a member and uh, they were really being challenged in the area of their life and um, the enemy was really um, pressing in. But in the midst of that, um, I had to tell him, I said, in spite of what it is right now, in spite of what you have to confront right now in terms of the enemy, uh, God is still good. Not only is God still good, God still loves you. And, you know, it's in times like this, um, you know, we haven't seen, I haven't seen a time like what we're dealing with right now with the, uh, with the um, things being unstable and things being kind of chaotic. It, it's been, a, I haven't seen times like this since the 60s. And it's in times like this when things are uncertain and every day it's just something um, coming at us. Uh, it's in times like this that you have to remember as a believer that God is, he's still good in spite of what it looks like, in spite of what it sounds like. The God that you and I serve, he's still a good God. He's still on the throne and he still has a unconditional love for the people of God. And so tonight I just want to just, I'm just talking tonight and I want to talk about the goodness and the love of God. Over in Psalms 107, verse 8, the text says, Oh, that man would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Then verse 9, the text says, For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. The psalmist says, Oh, that man would praise the Lord for his wonderful works and for his goodness towards, towards man. God is, he's good, man. He is, he's incredibly good. Psalms 34, verse 8, the, te the text says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And then verse 9, the text says, Oh, fear the Lord, ye saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. I, I love this verse because the text says that for those of us who fear the Lord, and that word fear means reverence to the Lord. For those of us who reverence the Lord or respect the Lord, there's no want to them that, that reverence him or fear him. In other words, when you and I, when we uh, reverence God, when we respect God, and we understand his, his goodness towards us, the text says there's no want. Now, the only thing that can stop uh, the goodness of God or limit the goodness of God in the life of a believer is that for that believer not to receive his goodness. Let me say that again. The only thing that can stop the goodness of God or limit the goodness of God in the life of a born again believer is for that believer to limit uh, the goodness by not receiving the goodness of God. You have to be able to position yourself to receive the goodness of God. Um, have ever been in a situation where you wanted to show kindness towards someone and that person, for whatever reason, refused the kindness? Say you wanted to bless them with uh, some finances or you wanted to pay a bill or you wanted to 
do something for them. You just wanted to show a, a sense of kindness towards them because of the, the care and the love that you have for the person. And for whatever reason, that person just refused to receive uh, your, your, your gift of kindness, your gift of goodness. And, uh, of course, once they uh, 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 refuse to receive uh, your gift of kindness, the only thing you can do is just to hold on to it and, and you know, find somebody else to bless. It's the same thing with God. The only thing that can limit the goodness of our God in our lives as believers is for us to not to receive his goodness. And I want to encourage you tonight to, to um, receive the goodness of God. Receive his love. Yes, this is challenging times. Yes, we're dealing with um, things that are uh, out of the ordinary. Yes, if you, a lot of us are, are, uh, are uh, stressed out over a lot of things, and, and, and rightfully so. But the reality is, man, in spite of it all, God is still abundantly good. And we have to be able to position our, our hearts and our minds to be able to just sit back and just breathe in his goodness, just take in his love and his kindness. And sometimes that means that you have to steal yourself. Sometimes that means that you have to just, you know, go into a room, shut the door, turn off the television, shut everybody out, sit still and just just, just lift your hands and just, just breathe in the presence of the living God. Just, just take him all in and just allow yourself to, to fall into his presence and allow him to love on you. Allow, you, have, you know, you have to allow God to love on you. Uh, God, you know, he won't force himself on us. We have to allow him to, to love us and to embrace us, and he will. Um, the Bible now, when you look at the text, the Bible defines God's goodness in, in two ways. First way that the Bible defines God's goodness uh, is his character. Goodness has to do with the character of God. You know, God is good. You know, we, we say that, you know, uh, we make that statement, God is good, and we say all the time. But the reality is God is good. It, that's his character. And when you look at the Bible, the Bible defines goodness as the character of of God are one of the characteristics of God. Psalms 119 verse 68 the text says thou art good and doeth good and so the text says thou art good talking about God you are good and you doeth good. Uh, good is who God is. Goodness the goodness of God is just a part of his, his character. It's a part of who he is. He can't help but be good because that's just a part of the facet of who he is. He's a good God, and he does good things for a people who will respect him and reverence him. Psalms 31, verse 19, the NIV translation, the text says, How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of man on those who take refuge in you. Now notice what the text says. The text says, How great is your goodness, then it says, which you store up for those who fear you. In other words, God, goodness is great, and he stores it up <laughs> for those who respect him or reverence him. And then the text says, which you bestow in the sight of men on those who take refuge in you. In other words, he stores it up, and then he, he pours it out on those who, who respect him in the eyesight of other men. In other words, other people will see God. Uh, bless you with his goodness that he has stored up for you when you reference him and when you respect him. You know, you can look at certain people and just know that the goodness of God is just flowing in their life. You can just look at them and you know that they're blessed. You know, they're just blessed. You can look at them and know that the hand of God is working in their life, that the hand of God is on them, that the presence and the anointing of God is on their life. And that's because these individuals are just basting in the presence of God. They, they are spending time in his word. They're spending time loving on God and, and allowing God to love back on them. And you can see it. There's times, man, I can walk in someone's home, man, and I can just sense the presence of God. There's times I can drive up into the, the parking lot, man, and the presence of God will greet you, man, as soon as you get out of the car. And you, you know as soon as you hit the driveway and hit the home of those individuals or that person that this is a family or this is 
an individual who has been loving on God and allowing God to love back on them. It's evident. I mean, you, it, it's, it's evident. You can, you can sense it. You can, to, to, because see, the anointing, the presence of God is tangible. Let me say that again. The anointing of God is tangible. The presence of God is tangible. You can sense the presence of God. You can feel the presence of God. And so when you can feel the presence of God and, and, and sense uh, his anointing, man, you know that God is loving on uh, these people and these people are loving back on God. And this is where you want to be. This is what the text says, that God, he stores up his goodness and he bestows it on those who take refuge in him. And part of his goodness is his presence, is his anointing. Amen. Now, the, the second way that this, the text describes the goodness of God, it has to do not only with his, his, his character, but it has to do with uh, 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 his actions, if you will. Uh, Psalms 145, verse 3, the text says, and again, I'm reading on the NIV translation. The text says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. Let me stop right there. Verse 3. It says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. That, that, that's incredible right there because he is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of us uh, 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 magnifying him. And his greatness is unsearchable. One of the things that just blesses me. Uh, with our parking lot uh, service, uh, for those of you who haven't been out there, I'm telling you, it's, it's been an incredible time. Uh, it's quick, but it's absolutely incredible. Being out in that parking lot, 8.30 in the morning, you're out there in the fresh air, you're looking up at the sky, the sky is blue, you can see the clouds, you can hear the bird, birds chipping, and you can see the sun starting to come through the clouds. Man, I'm telling you, it's just something incredible about just being able to do that out in the open air, with your hands lifted up for those who desire to. Uh, they just stand in front of their cars and they just lift their hands up, man. And the praise team is, is worshiping God, man. We all stand there worshiping God. And you just out there in the open air, just feeling the nature, God's nature and his creation. And you right there in the midst of it, man. I'm telling you, in that moment right there, you know that the goodness of God is just absolutely unsearchable. Man, you're looking at the blueness of the sky. You're looking at the whiteness of the clouds. The sun is beaming in and you can feel the warmth of the sun. You can see the birds right behind you on a bush and the air is blowing and the wind is just is kind of blowing, if you will. You just, man, it's like, man, this is absolutely incredible. It's an incredible moment. And then the praise team is, is this last, I, I don't mean to go on a tangent, but this last Sunday, the praise team, man, they were singing with our, uh, instruments, man, and they hit this acapella no, man, I'm telling you, the anointing of God just kind of fill, filled the whole parking lot. Man, everybody was like, ooh, man. It's like the presence of God just gushed in on that parking lot. And I'm telling you, it's times like that, you're like, man, this is, this, this is incredible. This is absolutely incredible. And you can sense the greatness of God and the vastness of God. And you know right then, man, we serve an incredible God. There's no way that you can be in an experience like that and say, God is not good or he's not incredible. It's when those moments like there, man, you can say, man, we serve an incredible God. Then you look down, you see an ant crawling across the, the parking lot. Man, you're like, man, this is, this, this is this absolutely incredible. But the text says in verse 4, One generation should praise thy works to another and should declare thy mighty acts. It says from generation to generation, one generation is going to praise the Lord to the next generation and declare his mighty acts. In other words, uh, I'm going to declare to my children how awesome God is and how good he is. And then my children are going to declare to their children how awesome God is and how uh, uh, incredible he's been to us as a family. And he's talking about what generation to generation should praise the, the work of God and shall declare his mighty acts. And then it says in verse 9, the Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. I'm going to stop right there. It says that the Lord is good to everybody. It says the Lord is good to all. In other words, God don't leave anybody out. The text says it rains to the just and the unjust. God is good to everybody. I mean, God is good to everybody. No one's left out, even for those who 
you might think don't deserve his goodness, even for those who are not serving him or who have not yet come into the knowledge of him, God is still good to them. He's still good to them. God is a good God. And he's an incredible God. The text says, the Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. In other words, he's good to everybody and his mercy covers everything he does. It is by his mercies that we're not consumed. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for him watching over us every day. Every situation, every circumstance. There is not a situation or circumstance that you are experiencing right now that the mercy of God has not been extended. God's mercy is there. It may not seem like it, but his mercy is there. The text says his tender mercies are over all his works. Everything he does, his mercy is there. Now, you and I as, as believers, we have to take the responsibility of responding to the goodness of God. Let me say that again. You and I, we have the responsibility as believers to respond to the goodness of God. God's goodness, hear me now, God's goodness re requires a response. There's, there's no way that you and I can, can sit back and be a beneficiary of the goodness of God and not respond to it. His goodness requires a response if you are a believer. Now, I, everybody should be responding to the goodness of God, but especially a born-again believer. When you know that God's been good to you, when you know that God has extended mercy toward you, you deserve, or should I say, God deserves for you to, to, to respond to his goodness. Now, it's important that we, let me put it this way, I'll be careful how I say this because I want you to misunderstand me. It's important for you and I to recognize when we are being uh, uh, ungrateful and have an uh, a attitude of unbelief, should I say, and an in, uh, attitude of ingratitude. It's important for us to recognize when we are allowing ourselves to go that way or when we've been operating in that way. Now, we all have those moments. We all have those moments when we want to complain. We all have those moments when um, we think life is not fair. We all have those moments when we think, God, I've been praying and you act like if you are deaf, you act like you don't hear me. Or we have those moments when we're thinking, God, when are you going to move on my behalf. When are you going to do something, God? I've been asking you and asking you. We all have those moments when we start pouting before God and, and, and we start throwing a, a, what I call a Christian tipper tantrum, where we just try to, you know, we just get in the, into a funk because we think that getting into a funk is going to make God do what we want him to do because it, it works with our spouses or it works with supervisors or it works with somebody else. But the reality is it doesn't work with God, but we do it anyway. We try it anyway because we get into a, the habit of doing things like that. But it's important for us to, to repent when we know that we have allowed ourselves to operate in a way that is ungrateful and in a way that uh, we've been uh, allowing ourselves to, to, to operate in unbelief. In times like that, we, we have to repent. We cannot, as Christians, know that we have been operating in a certain way that's, that's not pleasing to God and then not repent to him, not say, God, I'm sorry for how I conducted myself. I'm sorry for how I acted, Lord. But I, I'm sorry for going off this morning on you. I'm sorry, Lord, for pouting this afternoon. I'm, I'm sorry, Lord, for having a bad attitude. I, I'm sorry, Lord, for... Uh, uh, trying to suggest, God, that you haven't been good to me. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Lord. We, we have to repent of those type of attitudes. Romans chapter 2, verse 4 says this, Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Man, I love this translation. Watch what it says now. It says, don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? How I many you know that God's patient with us? Not only is he patient with us, 
he tolerates a lot of stuff from us. And then the text says, doesn't this mean anything to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin or turn you from, from sin? And he's saying that, the text is saying that God is kind towards us. He's tolerant towards us. He's patient towards us. And the text says that his kindness towards us and his patience towards us is intended to turn us away from our sins. Now, when we allow ourselves to become negative, that's a sign that we have forgotten about the goodness of God. Let me say that again. When you and I allow ourselves to become negative about everything, or a lot of things, or even some things, that's a sign that we have allowed ourselves to forget about the goodness of God. The text says that God's tolerant towards us, he's patient towards us, and that his kindness towards us is to get us to turn away from sin. And anytime we as believers, when we allow our conversations to go negative, we allow our thinking to go negative, we allow our actions to go negative, that is an indication that we have forgotten just how good God is. It's, there's no way that you can, 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 can uh, uh, embrace the goodness of God and the, and, the, and the kindness of God and have that on your mind and still allow uh, your communication to go negative. There, there's no way that you can allow your actions to go negative when you remember the goodness of God. Even though that situation is not favorable to you, when you remember how good God's been to you, it's like, okay, I, okay, I see. It's going to be okay because God's been really good to me. Or God's going to turn this around. Or you don't allow yourself to speak something when you know that in spite of it, God's been good. Now, David says this in Psalms 27, verse 13, and verse 14, New Living Translation. David says, in verse 13, Yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. Verse 14, David says, wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. David says, I am confident that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. David knew for sure. David said, you know what? In spite of my situation, my enemies are out to get me. Uh, Things are not going according to plan. He says, man, in spite of that, I am confident that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's where we have to be. Once we understand that God is good and he loves us unconditionally, you, you have to know that in spite of what you're dealing with, when it's all said and done, you, you, you have to know that you're going to see God's hand move in your situation. You have to know that, you know what, on the other side of this is a blessing. God's going to work this thing to my favor. God's going to work it to my good. In spite of, I know that I'm going to see the goodness of God in this situation. I'm telling you tonight, man, if you are a child of God and you're dealing with something right now in your life, whether it's with your children, with your finances, with your physical body, you've got to know that God is good and you've got to embrace the fact that, you know what, I shall see the goodness of God in this situation, in this circumstance when it's all said and done, I shall see the goodness of God. You got to know that. You got to know that. If you don't embrace the fact that God is good and you will see the goodness of the Lord in your situation, the enemy will try to depress you and he will try to get you to doubt God and to doubt his word. And you got to come back and say, you know what? God is true. The text says, let God be true and every man a liar. You got to come back and say, you know what? In spite of what it looks like, in spite of what has been spoken, God is good, and in spite of it, I'm going to see the goodness of God in this situation. Amen, somebody. For those of you, this is just in my spirit, I'm just, I'm just getting it out there. For those of you who are dealing with relationships that seem to be going south, whether it's with your children, whether it's with your spouse, whether it's with your parents, or with your friends, whatever, you got to say, you know what, I'm going to still see God's goodness in this situation. God, some kind of way, somehow, is going to supernaturally intervene and I shall see the goodness of God in this relationship. Amen. Now, uh, we have to learn to
to rest in the goodness of God even when adversity comes. Even when problems come. Even when trouble comes, we have to learn how to just rest in the goodness of God. Psalms 31 verse 19 the NIV translation says, how great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestowed inside of man on those who take refuge in you. We read that earlier, but it talks about the greatness of God and the goodness of God that he, he bestows on those who fear him. In other words, for those of us who reverence God, respects God, he has a goodness that he has stored up for us and he, he pours it out on us. Um, when we stop trusting God in challenging times and difficult times, when we allow ourselves to stop trusting him and stop trusting his word, that's a sign that we have uh, forgotten his goodness. Let me say that again. When you and I stop trusting God, when we stop trusting his word, when we fall back on what we know, when we fall back on what we think might work, when we fall back on the human flesh trying to resolve an issue and stop trusting his word, stop trusting his way, that is a sign that you and I have forgotten his goodness. David says in Psalm 16, verse 1 through verse 2, NIV translation, David says, keep me safe, O God. For in you I take refuge. Verse 2, David says, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. So David says, keep me safe. Because I'm taking refuge in you, God. And apart from you, I have no good thing. And so you and I, we, we can't stop trusting uh, God in difficulties and in challenges. We got to know that even when we're up against adversity, uh, we still have to rest in the goodness of God. Even when we are on, in situations that are um, challenging our flesh, we just got to stay steady and rest in the goodness of God. Now, what will help you do that is when you're in challenging times or when adversity comes to, to, to move you off the word, What's going to help you rest in the goodness of God is the fact that you know that God's goodness comes from his love. Let me say that again. What's going to help you remain steady and steadfast in his word when the winds are blowing, the winds of adversity are blowing your way. What's going to help you remain uh, uh, stable and rest in his goodness and not be moved is for you to remember and understand that the goodness of God comes from the love of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, the text says, But God commanded his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let me read you that same verse out of Amplified. Love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, died for us. On the cross... Jesus Christ demonstrated his love for us that we might be saved. What does that mean? It simply means that you and I can remain stable and, and, and confident in his goodness and not be moved by adversity because we understand that his goodness extends from his love that he has demonstrated towards us when he died on the cross. That simply means that God loves us now. He loves us now just like he loves us then, regardless, watch this now, regardless of our past mistakes, our sins, and our uh, iniquities. He loves us. He loves us then, or he loved us then, and he loves us now. And he demonstrated that love towards us by dying on the cross for our sins. And so when we embrace the fact that his goodness has nothing to do with us. See, that's, that's the thing. We think that he's good towards us because we've been good. No, 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 we're not talking about a Santa Claus. You know, you have this thing where, you know, growing up, you better be good, but, you know, because he knows who's naughty and nice. 
And you, if you're naughty, you don't, you know, he's not going to be good to you. But if you're good, he's going to be good to you. No, no, no. God's not a Santa Claus. God is uh, Lord of creation. He is our, our, our Savior, and he loves us in spite of us. See, his love and his goodness has nothing to do with us. So we don't earn his goodness. We don't earn his love. He loves us in spite of ourselves. He, he's good to us in spite of ourselves. And he demonstrated his love and his goodness by dying on that cross. And the mere fact that he died on that cross is enough for us to understand, okay, in spite of myself and in spite of how I feel, I can stay stable and not move off of his word because I know that his goodness and his love stems from the fact that he loves us whether or not we understand his love or not. You and I, you and I can't do anything to keep God from loving us and being good to us. Let me say that again. You and I cannot do anything to keep God from being good to us and keep God from loving us. Because we have nothing to do with his love in terms of him loving us. We have nothing to do with his, his goodness towards us. He's good to us because that's who he is. He loves us because that's who he is. Love is who he is. God is love. He can't help but loving because that's a part of his characteristic. He can't help but being good because that's a part of who he is. He's a good God. He's a loving God. So whether or not we act a fool or whether or not we go with the program has nothing to do with whether or not he loves us or not loves us or is good to us or not good to us. He demonstrated that love and that goodness when he died on the cross for our, for our sins, not just our sins, but the sins of all humanity. So we can rest in the fact that he's good to us and not be moved by anything else because of his love towards us. And that love is demonstrated through the blood or the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary Hill. Oh, man, that's good stuff right there. Amen. He loves us and he's good to us because that's who he is. God is love. God is good. Towards everybody. Amen. Now, I want to make three points about the love and the goodness of God as I get ready to wrap this teaching up. The first point I want to make is it's about God's love. And one of the things that is hard for us to embrace as, as believers is that God's love is unconditional. And God, now watch this, he loved us and was good to us before he ever created the earth. Now, get a hold of that. He loved us and he was good to us before he ever spoke into existence the earth. Watch what the text says. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and verse 5, the NIV translation. Verse 4 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Verse 5 says, He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Man, that'll blow your mind right there. That right there is, is mind-blowing to me anyway. And that is the God, he loved us and he was good to us before he created the earth, before he created the world. He says, the text says, he chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. He chose us. <laughs> he chose us before he created the earth. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. Man, get a hold of that. God was good to us and he loved us before he ever created the world. Man, that's good stuff right there. He chose us. He adopted us to be sons and daughters, if you will. Uh, when I was growing up uh, playing sports, I've never been um, uh, a sports guy. I've never been one to play basketball and Football. I never did. I, I used to work. I used to work. That's all I did. I, I worked 
made money. From the time I was 10, I was hustling. I wasn't uh, picking up pop bottles. I was cutting grass. If I wasn't cutting grass, I was shoveling snow. If I wasn't shoveling snow, I was taking out somebody's trash. I, all I did was chase the dollar. At the age of 10, I just, you know, I, I just chased the dollar. My, my, my father and them used to go, stepfather and them used to go fishing. They would pay me. Now some, this might gross uh, some of you ladies out, so I'm just giving you uh, a warning here. Uh, but they would pay me a penny for a worm, what you used to call night crawlers, night crawlers. And so at night, I would go out and I would get worms and, 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 and put them in this bucket. I used to have buckets of worms. I used to get a penny a worm because my, my stepfather would go fishing. And that's how I made money, man. I'd go out and get those worms. I'd be out all night with a flashlight picking up worms, especially when it rained, picking up what they call night crawlers. But anyway, I used to work. That's all I did was work. So when it came time to play uh, basketball, or we used to play uh, kick soccer in the street, uh, and, and basketball in the back alley. When it came time to, to play sports, uh, you had your captains, and the captains got to choose their, their, their team. And of course, uh, no one wanted me because I was not an asset to the team. I, I, you know, I just I was not good, and so of course no one wanted me on their their team because you know I was no benefit. You had a lot of other folks who were better than me. Even some of uh, one of my sisters was better than me, and so they would choose everybody but me. But I always knew that I was going to be chosen. I always knew that my oldest brother was going to choose me. Now, I was going to be the last one he chose, but I knew that he was going to choose me. I, I didn't worry. I wasn't concerned because I knew that I was going to be on the team. Now, some folks didn't get chose. So, you know, you had more people. You only had like five players, six players, whatever it was on the side, and you had more people than you had who, wanted to be, who needed to be chosen than that, was, than that was needed on the team. And so oh, I always knew that, okay, I may be the last one, but Butchie was going to choose me. Now, again, I was the last one he chose. He got everybody else that he could, but then he gave up a slot for me. I knew he was going to do it. He was my brother. He says, come on, I got you. And he chose me. Now, what am I saying? <laughs> I'm saying that God chose you and I before the foundation of the world, before the creation of the world, to be good to and to love. And it had nothing to do with us. It had everything to do with the fact that he loves us. My brother, when he chose me to be on his team, had nothing to do with me. I was, I was not, I couldn't even dribble. He knew it. I wasn't gonna make any points. He knew it. I was most likely gonna foul people. He knew it. But he didn't choose me because I could add to the team. He chose me because he loved me as his little brother. What am I saying? I'm saying God chose us, man. He has chosen you and I before the creation of the world to love and to be good to. Man, if you can just get a hold of that right there. I mean, I could stop teaching right now. If you can just, just accept the fact that God chose you before he created the world to be good to and to love. Man, that's good right there. And then the second point I want to make about the goodness and the love of God is this. God's goodness and his love will always, but always, but always be unconditional. Hebrew chapter 13, verse 5, the text says, I would never leave thee nor forsake thee. God loves you and I all the time. If God only loved you and I some of the time, but not all the time, that would mean that his character, his feelings, and his attitude were changeable. Let me say that again. If God only loved us some of the time and was only good to us some of the time and not all the time, that would mean that his character, his feelings, and his attitude were changeable. But God never changes. <laughs> he never changes. And so God says he would never leave us nor forsake us. What is he saying? He's saying that my love and my goodness towards you as my children is unconditional. It's 
not going to change. It's not going to change. His love, now watch this, his love and his goodness is not contingent upon us in terms of whether or not we go to church, whether or not we pray, whether or not we sin, or whether or not we witness. God loves us and he's good to us always, all the time, the same way, consistently constant. Ah, oh, that's good stuff right there. He's good to us and he loves us, whether or not we come to church or not. He good, he's good to us and he loves us whether or not we pray or not. He's good to us and he loves us whether or not we witness or not. He's good to us and he loves us whether or not we sin or not sin. He's good to us all the time. He's consistently constant. He never changes. And that is because his love and his goodness has nothing to do with us. It's not going to change. It's unconditional. So even when we have a bad day, even when we make mistakes, he still loves us. He still is good to us. I have four children. They're adults now. But, you know, raising my kids, uh, I'll use my oldest son, Jeremy, for an illustration. Um, I, I love Jeremy. I love all my kids unconditionally. Jeremy, Daniel, Burke, Chloe, I love them all. Unconditional love. And they're my sons and my daughters, whether or not they wake up in the morning with a bad day or not, whether or not they, they sin or not, whether or not they talk back to me or not, whether or not they do their chores or not, whether or not they get a good grade or bad grade, it doesn't matter. They are still my children, and I still have a love for them. Not because they get good grades or they're respectful. Not because they uh, uh, love me back. I love them because they're mine. You understand what I'm saying? If you're a parent, you understand what I'm saying. You understand that you love your child unconditionally. You love your child no matter what that child does from one day to the next. You're good to that child regardless of whether or not that child uh, uh, receives your goodness or not, or that child reciprocates that goodness back towards you. You're still good to them. Why? Because you love them and you're good to them unconditionally. This is where God is towards us. God is saying, you are my child, Doug, whether you wake up, wake up with a good attitude or not, whether you pray or not, whether you witness or not, whether you go to church or not, you are still my child. I still love you, and I'm still going to be good to you. The same thing as a natural parent you are to your own children. You have parents right now who have kids who have uh, unfortunately made some, some bad mistakes, and they're locked up in a penitentiary. You know, when everybody else has given up on that child and, and walked away from that child and said, I just, you know, that person's no good or that individual's no good. That parent, that mother, she's never going to do that. She's never going to give up on that child, even though that child made a mistake and had to do some time and, and be incarcerated. That mother is never going give to up, give up on that child. That, never, that mother is never going to stop being good to that child. Why? Because that's her child. And it's the same thing with us, with God. God's never going to stop loving us. He's never going to stop being good to us, no matter what. Why? Because we belong to him. And watch this. He chose us. <laughs> Glory to God. We didn't choose him. And he chose to be good to us and to love us before the foundation of the world. Now my last point, I've got to close out. And that is this. When it comes to the goodness and the love of God. That's this. Every good gift comes from God. Let me say this again. Every good gift comes from God. James chapter 1 verse 17, the Amplified, it reads like this. Every good gift and every perfect, free, large, full gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of all that gives light in the shining of whom there can be no variation, rising or setting or shadow cast by his turning. What is the text saying? The text is saying simply this, every good thing that you have in your life, every good thing that comes to you comes from God. Every good gift, every good gift. 
Whatever you have that is good, whether it's a job, whether it's a home, whether it's a child, whether it's a spouse, whether it's money, whether it's good health, whatever it is that's good, it comes from God. It comes from the goodness of God's heart. Oftentimes we forget that. We forget that the blessings of the Lord come down from above. So whatever you have this evening in your life that you can point to that's good. Now I know everybody listening to me tonight can say, well, you know, I got this going on, this is not good, and I got that going on, that is not good. Yeah, I know. All of us can look at something in our life and say, okay, this particular area is not going according to plan. But the problem is that we take 10% of what's not going right and we take that 10% of, of negative and allow it to cancel out the other 90% that's going good. This is what happened in marriages. I don't, I don't know why I'm going this way, but oftentimes in marriages, you know, the, the couple starts out loving each other and seeing good in each other. That's why they get married. You don't marry somebody that you think, I, don't, I hate them, I'm going to marry them anyway. I hate them. I can't stand them because they're lazy. I can't stand them because, you know, they're on drugs. I can't stand them because they, they're, they're drunks. I can't stand them because they have a bad attitude. But I'm going to marry them anyway. That's not what you do. No, you, you, you found some good in that person. You fell in love with that person. But you find out after being with that person for a period of time, oh, this person is flawed. And so now you start focusing on the flaws of that person. And now you zero in on 20% of the flaws and you overlook the 80% that's good. And so because you got 20% that's flawed and the enemy keeps you focusing in on what's flawed. And every day you just constantly dwell on what's flawed and you overlook the other 80%. Now you want to divorce. Why? Because I see 20% flawed. And so you let 20% cancel out the other 80%. And so now you, you, your, your, your perception is, 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 is tainted, if you will. It's the same thing we do with our relationship with God. We think about he saved our soul. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. He's filled us with the Holy Spirit. Amen, somebody. He, he's, he's healed our body or he saved our children or our children are now starting to have a curiosity about the God that we serve. Our spouse has gotten saved or he's paid our rent or he healed our body or he, he's done something good. And so we know he's done something good, but then we look over in this one little area over here and, okay, the job, I, I didn't get the raise. I was supposed to get that raise. I trained the people who got the raise and I could God let that person get the raise because I trained that person and I'm more qualified. And so, you know, God is this, you know, God's he's an awful God. Because you didn't get the raise. But you overlooked the fact that your kids were saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. Your husband is trying to apply last week's sermon. Your light's been paid. Your mortgage has been paid. You got food in the icebox. You have all this good, 80%, 85% good. But now you over here focusing on this 15% that's not going your way. And normally, oh, shot that bullshot. Normally that 15% 15 is not going your way because God is trying to work something out of you. He's using that sandpaper to work on your character. And oftentimes we overlook that. We overlook oftentimes. See, the thing is, if it gets to us, oh, glory to God, whatever bad gets to us is because God has allowed it. And he has allowed it for whatever reason, and he allows it for his purposes. And normally when it gets to us, it's because God is trying to work character in us in some area of our lives. And he's using that 15 percent or that 10 percent or that 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 piece of you think uh, that you think is not good. He's using that as sandpaper, sandpaper to, to, to scrub off those character flaws out of you. But you so focus on, you know, uh, you not getting your way. You forget about the goodness of God. And you got to come to that place, man, where you just thank God. Okay, I don't like what's going on, but Lord, I thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure it out. I'm going to figure this thing out. you got to come to that place where you recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from above. Amen, somebody. That God is good. He loves us unconditionally. Amen. Now, let me read this last verse here. Let me let you go. I didn't mean to go off on a tangent right there, but... Praise God. I just, man, when I think about the goodness of God, mm, 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 it's just, um, 
I just, I just swell up. <laughs> it's hard for me to contain myself sometimes. But Psalms 100 verse 5, Living Bible Translation, as we get ready to close out. The text says, For the Lord is always good. He is always loving and kind. And his faithfulness goes on and on to each succeeding generation. That sums it up right there about our God. He's always good. He is always loving and kind. And his faithfulness goes on to each succeeding generation. In other words, he's faithful to Doug. And he's going to be faithful to the next generation to Jeremy and Daniel, Brooke and Chloe, and then to the next generation, to their kid children, and then to the next generation, to their children. Because that's the type of God we serve. He is a good, loving God. And I just want to remind you tonight about remembering, in spite of what you may be going through, in spite of what it looks like, in spite of what it sounds like out there in the noise of the world, we serve a God that is incredibly good. He is, he, is, he is so faithful to his children. And he's lo so loving that if we can just take a moment, pull back, and just receive his goodness and his love in those times when we feel overwhelmed, it would help us keep a balance in terms of our thinking and in terms of moving forward in our daily lives. Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, we just bless you and we honor you this evening. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to share the word of the Lord. And Father, we, we thank you for your, your goodness. <laughs> we thank you, Father, for your, your unconditional love. You are an incredible God. And we thank you, Father, for all that you're doing and all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you read the worship of the Lord in your giving? Amen. I'm going to turn over here to 1 Corinthians as we get ready to worship the Lord in our giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to read a verse to you as we get ready to worship the Lord in our giving. The text says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning with verse 6. But this I say, he was so sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he was so bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministers seed to the sower will minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Paul says a lot in these verses, but I think what's really key is the fact that God loves a cheerful giver. And we know this, we know this text, we know it by heart. I just want to remind you, the Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That God loves a chill forgiver. And so this evening, as we get ready to worship the Lord in our giving, I want you to pray, ask the Lord what he would have you to do. You trust him, obey him. And if you would, please, once you get your, your tithes and offerings prepared, just lift them towards heaven as a sign of contact. I want to pray over them for you. Amen. Uh, Father, we just thank you. And we thank you, Father, for the people of God. We thank you, Father God, for their generous spirits. We thank you, Father God, for these tithes and offerings. And Father, right now, as a corporate body, we bless, Father God, every seed that's been released into your work this evening, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we declare and decree every need represented this evening in the household of the saints to be met. We declare and decree every financial need, every personal need, every spiritual need, every emotional need. Father, we decree their needs met in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you this evening that the needs of your house are met. We thank you, Father God, that there's no lack in your house. And we thank you that there's no lack in the household of the saints. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you this evening. Thank you so much for tuning in. We look forward to ministering to you Sunday morning. Remember, we're having communion Sunday. 
communion this coming Sunday. Also, uh, pray about coming out, 830 parking lot service. Love to have you. God bless you. Enjoy your week.